Good morning, guys. We're going to begin talking about alignment today. We're going to talk about it from this standpoint, kind of a general question. How do you know your alignment's off? Okay, so how do you know your alignment's off? Well, you might suppose, for example, you let go of the steering wheel and it drifts really slowly to one side, or you let go of the steering wheel and it dives for the ditch, which you don't want, of course. Secondly, um, uh, you can have a pull. And a drift is considered like you let go of the steering wheel and in several hundred feet, it just starts to wander a little bit. Uh, a dive is you let go of it and you go into the ditch. A pull is you let go of it and it's going to one side, somewhere in between a drift and a dive. But anyways, we just say, is the car pulling to the right or to the left? We want the steering wheel to be straight. So if the steering wheel is not straight, we know we need an alignment. Now, it may be only, it may not be that the alignment's off such that it will wear the tires. But we do consider steering wheel not being straight to be a misalignment issue, and it is. And we'll talk about how to cure that. Hard handling. If the, the car is not easy to handle, if you're fighting, it's a tough steering situation, then your alignment can be off. Tire wear, of course, is probably the most uh, normal or common situation where we look at uh, us having a misalignment is we're wearing out our tires. And do remember that front-wheel drive cars have accelerated tire wear on the front. Um, and we have to be able to um, rotate those tires frequently to even out that tire wear and reduce it taking over on two wheels in particular. So the goals of alignment go like this. We want the vehicle to go straight and handle reasonably well. We don't want the vehicle to wander to, side or, uh, to either side. We don't want it to pull. We let go of that steering wheel, we go straight, and we handle reasonably well. We're not fighting the steering wheel trying to drive it. Now, granted, this all assumes a flat road with not a lot of crown uh, or not excessive crown and not a road that's completely flat that has no road crown. Road crown is the drainage off to each side for water. All roads should have some road crown. Otherwise, we're going to have puddling of water. We're going to make a hydroplane situation. Secondly, tires don't wear out prematurely. That's our second goal of alignment. So we want the vehicle to go straight, we want it to handle well, and we don't want the tires to wear out prematurely. We want them to last the 60,000 or 80,000 miles they're supposed to. We must have a straight steering wheel. Okay, so that's one of our goals of alignment. We must have a straight steering wheel. So uh, these are our at least three goals of alignment that we have, that things that we want to accomplish. And you need to think about them. It's kind of like in an engine where you go, okay, I need compression, I need fuel, I need air and spark and everything's got to happen at the right time the engine runs properly aligned car you could go straight and handles reasonably well tires don't wear out prematurely and you've got a straight steering wheel so here's our rules of alignment these are somewhat um, some are real specific but we call these our rules of alignment first tire pressure needs to be 10 percent less than max listed on the sidewall, or I'm saying these days we're closer to 15%. So if you have a 44 PSI tire, 10% is 4.4 pounds, 15% would be 6.6, 44 minus 6.6, roughly 37, 38 pounds right in there. We're going to check when they're cool, not going to check them when it's been sitting in direct sun, and we're always going to equalize tire pressure, meaning equal on all four wheels, okay, unless we have some exotic car, race car that's different. but. We want all four wheels to have the same tire pressure. Secondly, we're always going to pull to the side with the greater positive camber. And we haven't talked about alignment angles yet, but camber is the inward towards the engine or the outward lean of the tire um, towards the engine, away from the engine, as viewed from the front of the car. So you're looking at the tires from the front, they lean towards the engine or they lean away. Positive camber is away from the engine negative camber is toward the engine i always remember that by saying the engine is the ground for the battery so if the tire leans to the engine it's negative camber we're always going to pull to the side that has the most positive camber on it so if here's driver's tire and here's passenger tire and if the driver tire is leaning away from the engine and the passenger tire is straight well we're going towards the driver's side for example we're always going to pull to the side with the least negative cam caster, least negative caster, or you could say the most positive caster. But most all cars have negative caster, so we say the least negative caster is if I'm viewing the tire, and I'll grab one here. So caster is if I'm viewing the tire from the side and looking at it like this, and 
I draw it, if that's the car's going that way, if I draw an imaginary line through the steering pivot's upper ball joint here, lower ball joint here, or the strut, if it's if the lower pivot is in front of the upper pivot, we say we have positive caster. If the lower pivot is behind the upper pivot, then we have negative caster. So positive caster, I always tell kids we remember it, think positive about Harley. So a big Harley chopper has extreme positive caster. Shopping cart has negative caster. Positive caster wants to go straight. Negative caster wants to turn. All right, next one we've got here is radial tire pull. So a radial tire can cause a pull. It gets what we call tire conicity. And if you think about a, um, uh, if you think about a, just move this over just a little bit. If you think about a, um, a styrofoam cup and um, when it's laying on its side it rolls in a circle because one side's smaller than the other that's a cone shape so we get tire conicity sometimes by a radial tire um, belt being shifted and it causes a pull it's pretty dramatic so we always like to go ahead and um, rotate the tires and um, hopefully get rid of that by rotating it or at least diagnosing it Next, at a constant speed on a flat road, a vehicle should go straight for 50 feet. But I'm going to say at approximately 35 miles an hour, because if you're at 70, 50 feet is pretty quick. So at a constant speed on a flat road, relatively flat with a small amount of road crown for drainage, a vehicle should go straight for 50 feet. A pole is a dive for the ditch, just to kind of emphasize what we said earlier. You let go of the steering wheel, and you're pulling hard to the ditch. Um, that's that's a not a good situation. <laughs> Drift is moving off the road within 50 feet. And, you know, a lot of times in 50 feet, you could hit an imperfection in the road, a uh, slight variation in how the road was paved, and it starts moving you off. Um, if you're driving near Los Osos Valley Road and you're on 101, you usually got wind in the afternoon pushing you pretty hard to the south. So you got to kind of take into a, account some of those let's call them environmental factors and whether or not it's causing a drift within 50 feet. So here we're going to start talking about alignment angles. And so the first alignment angle we're going to talk about is camber. And you can see I've got some pictures here um, of alignment angles. So camber is what we call a directional control angle, a directional control angle. Um, the amount of lean of the tire towards the engine um, or away from the engine, you can see this one has positive camber because the engine's over here we're leaning away from the engine the amount of lean there affects our directional control so we call it a directional control angle the inward negative leaning of the tire or the outward positive leaning of the tire uh, it is the inward or outward tilt of the wheel at the top viewed from the front of the car so if you're looking at the front of the car the engine's here the car's coming at you if it leans towards the engine that's negative camber and away from the engine that's positive camber Okay. Um, camber will cause a pull to the most positive side because of tire conicity. So when you see it leaning positive like that, it tends to get um, cone shaped. So whichever of the two front tires has more positive, it's going to go that way. So if this one has two degrees positive and this one's zero, we're going that way. This one has three degrees positive and this has two degrees positive, we're going that way. Okay. Um, if we, if the um, difference in caster angles is a, around a half a degree, then road crown comes into effect, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Camber is the second fastest tire wear factor, or second fastest tire wear factor, meaning, meaning if camber's off, it'll wear out the tires pretty fast. Not as fast as toe. Toe's the number one tire wear factor, but we've got to keep our camber angles pretty close to zero most of the time. We measure it in degrees. Um, zero would be straight up and down, okay? So tilting out away from, uh, tilting, sorry, away from the engine would be several degrees positive, however many. Tires always migrate toward negative camber because of suspension wear. So as the suspension fatigues, we tend to migrate towards negative camber. 
You always want zero rolling camber or as close to it as you can. Don't think about the exotic German cars on the rear where they have quite a bit of negative camber for handling. But in most situations where tire wear is a concern, we want basically zero rolling camber or very close to it so we can reduce tire wear. Further, you can keep your camber adjustment slightly positive. We, uh, we always recommend keeping your camber slightly positive because of spring fatigue causing negative camber. Now, granted, we're not, again, we're not talking about high performance stuff. And pretty good picture here of positive camber when the engine's over there, and here's negative camber leaning in. Um, zero camber or slightly positive camber works pretty good for steering, for tire wear. Negative camber works pretty good for handling, um, but it's not real good on tire wear in any case. We always put a quarter degree more positive camber on the left front to compensate for road crowns so the car goes straight. But wait a second. Some people do this. Some technicians will put about a quarter degree more positive on the driver's side than we have on the negative on the passenger. So if we have one degree positive camber on the front left, they'll put three quarters of a degree positive on the front right to offset road crowns. So the car wants to go towards the middle and road crown port pushes it away, the car goes straight. But a lot of us like to use caster for this rather than camber. I try and use caster. Um, sometimes we'll use camber if we can't get caster adjusted the way we want, but um, I like to use caster because it doesn't affect uh, wear. So some, what some people do, if, the, if they want their camber in zero, or let's say they want it a quarter degree positive, um, sometimes they'll people will put this at, um, let's say, three-eighths of a degree positive and the other side at one-eighth degree positive. So the net difference um, is a quarter of a degree positive. For wider tires, camber must be kept near zero to prevent outer edge wear. So wide tires are really, really susceptible to camber wear. The wider the tire, the more the tire wear if camber is not near zero. Something to think about when you put wide tires. You really got to watch your camber staying real close to zero. For wider tires, some people put an eighth more positive on the left and an eighth more negative on the right. So you're only an eighth away from zero on either tire, but the difference is you've got a quarter degree of camber spread and that counteracts or offsets road crown. The tire non-wear zone for camber adjustments for radials is a negative quarter to positive three quarter. And again, the positive three quarter because the, the suspension bounce and wear tends to migrate negative. So if you keep it between a negative degree, uh, quarter degree and a positive three quarters degree, you typically don't have much tire wear. Rear tire camber should always be the same on each side, about a negative quarter degree, negative half. It's a little bit better for vehicle stability. You will tend to wear the tires out a little more, especially if they're wide tires, if you get out towards a negative degree, uh, a negative half degree of camber. So here's caster now. Caster is what we call the directional control angle. Caster is an imaginary line through the steering pivots as viewed from the side of the car. So this is positive caster. This is negative caster. Okay. This is, think positive about Harleys. This is the shopping cart, if you will. There's another caster angle there. Okay. And the reason why the car, the car tends to always pull, um, well, let me just say this. It says it's the forward or rear wheel tilt of the steering axis as viewed from the side of the car. So as viewing from the side, it's what we call the forward or rear wheel, rearward tilt of the steering axis. So the steering axis is like this, or the steering axis is like this, turning right or left. Um, it will cause a pull, pull to the side that's least positive. So the side that's greater negative, that's the side it's going to pull to. The way you think about uh, casters, if you have positive caster, it's as if you tie a rope to the tire and you're pulling it forward. So, so if this is the driver's side and this is the passenger side, and I have more positive on the driver's side, the car is going to go like this towards the negative side. Okay, and um, so there you go. The reason for that is the more positive you have. When you turn the wheel, you're dipping the spindle towards the street. The spindle will spin an arc like this, okay? And so as you turn, you dip the tire towards the street. It's actually, yeah. 
it's you dip the tire towards the street and it'll tend to push it away to the other side. You must have a minimum difference of one half degree uh, caster to cause a pull. So inside a half a degree between each side, you, the car won't pull really, unless you have a half degree more positive on the driver's side and your camber is zero on both sides, well then road crown's gonna cause you to pull to the right. It's not the difference in caster, it's, it's having too much positive caster on the front left and not offsetting road crown. So you could put, on this what I like to do, is I like to put a half degree more positive on the right front and that offsets the road crown and doesn't cause tire wear and then keep the, keep the camber really close to zero on each side or at least close to spec on each side. Caster doesn't wear tires, okay? Yeah, there's some cars when the caster's off, like a Nova, it, because of the strut rod, it tends to affect, when you adjust the caster, it tends to affect toe, but, but for all intents and purposes, caster does not wear the tires. So don't worry about tire wear on caster, just be concerned with it on camber and toe. We're always gonna set caster even on both front wheels, or you can develop bump steer, but uh, up until about a half degree. And this is, uh, this is where I go. Some say that you can have a max of half degree caster spread offset rear crown without bump steer, and that's my experience. Bump steer is when you hit a bump, the car wants to dodge to one side or the other. And, and I find below a half degree, I'm not used to that. But people who own a car that's more performancey and they drive it a lot, and they're really sensitive to it, they may feel things that you or I would not feel. Those of you with trucks, you're not gonna feel a lot because the tires are so knobby, the tires have a mind of their own, they're gonna pull the car you know, all different ways and you can't be too worried about that uh, when you have a truck, et cetera. But if you have a performance vehicle, if you have you know, a, a Z uh, or you have a, a Miata, I think Jack me out, but anyways, if you have something like that, um, it's a lot lower. It's a handling car and he might notice things or they might notice things that you and I on the average person might not notice. Caster is measured in degrees, by the way. Caster, um, a couple other things. You need positive caster to go straight with stability. So think about the, the Harley. You know, you're going straight with stability. They can take one hand off, no problem, because the car really wants to go straight. Look at those goons. All right, let's keep going here. The weight of the vehicle is projected in front of the tire patch with positive caster, making the wheel think it's being pulled. So the tire patch is where the tire actually contacts the road. And the forks project a line out in front of that. So it has the effect of the tire feeling like it's being pulled forward. And that tends to want to keep it straight, okay? So it's where the weight of the vehicle is being projected in front of the, of the wheel. Max positive caster is really good for highway driving, okay? Because the car wants to go straight, so you don't have to fight it so much it's not so tiring but it causes road shock and more steering effort around town. So you tend to get more shock because, because when you hit a bump, the force is typically going this way. And when you have lots of positive caster, your shocks are going this way. So you don't have the effect of minimizing out the, uh, um, the bouncing effect of hitting a, a, a bump or hitting a dip as you're going down the road. Um, so positive caster tends to be a little bit rougher a ride, whereas closer to zero, it's a little bit uh, nicer ride. Think about a road racing car. It's going to, you don't want to have too much positive caster because you're going to have to swing that thing fast in corners. But anyways, minimum caster is good for turning, but causes high speed instability. So think about the shopping cart. When you run and you jump in the shopping cart in the parking lot at Costco or Home Depot, and the thing wants to go all over the place. Well, there's your high speed instability with too much negative caster or too little positive caster. Caster will help return the wheels to a straight ahead position out of a turn because the spindle is dipping to the street and and it wants to push away from the street as you turn. So when you turn, the spindle here is going to kind of dip down if you turn this way to the right. It's going to dip down and it's going to tend to deflect the tire back to the straight ahead position. So having positive caster really helps you return to a straight ahead position out of a turn. Third and finally of the main uh, alignment angles is toe. And toe is the difference between the front and rear edges of the two front tires. So in this case, the vehicle's going this way, the engine's here. If this 
tire is in like that and tire is in like that, we say we have toe in, or what we call pigeon toed. If we're toed in or pigeon toed, we're going to wear the tires out pretty fast. Toe is the number one cause of tire wear uh, if it's off. It'll wear the tires out fast because as you're going straight down the road, it's kind of rolling sideways and scrubbing the rubber right off. Toe does not cause a pull. If I align this car so this wheel straight and this one has a bunch of toe in, as soon as I go forward, the wheels will split the difference because of the steering being connected. So it can't uh, cause a pull, but it definitely wears the tires out. Bias plate tires will have feather edging from the from the toe. We don't need to talk about bias plate tires too much, but all we mean on that is that they'll be kind of, as you rub your hand this way, you'll feel a sharp edge. And if you go this way, it's smooth. So the edge will stand up. It does not radial tires a little bit with a with a lot of um, with a lot of in um, toe wear on a tire. It will cause it. Okay. Radial tires tend to have smooth edge wear, that's true. But I have seen some tires get some feather edging when the toe's really been off. But typically, it's smooth wear. So a tire that has wear on it because of um, a misalignment caused by toe is, believe it or not, um, kind of hard to detect um, whether it's toe or camber, because camber wear will look the same on the tire as well, at least on radial tires. Grossly misadjusted toe will cause feather edging, just something I was already saying there. Okay. So that your toe is, are they toed in, pigeon toe, or are you toed out, bow-legged, uh, and so on. Um, most cars will have a, usually set the alignment slightly toed in because as you go down the road, the road tends to try and deflect the tires out towards the toed out position. Too much toe in shows up first on the outside edge of the right front tire. That's because of road crown. Too much toe out shows up first on the inside edge of the left front tire also due to road crown. So it's just a tendency that when you see um, outside edge on a right front tire and nowhere else, you're thinking, okay, I got camber wear or maybe I got too much toe in. And if it's on the inside edge of the left front wheel, I'm thinking I got negative, uh, positive, negative camber wear or I got too much toe out. You must have zero rolling toe while you wear out the tires. This is really important. You want to have zero rolling toe. So most um, cars will have you set it just slightly in because it, as it hits the road, it tends to deflect it out slightly. Toe is measured in degrees, although it used to be measured in inches, but now it's measured in degrees. So you must have zero rolling toe while you wear the tires out. Okay, so here's another alignment angle. Um, it's not one of our main angles, but we will talk about it. It's called steering axis inclination. Steering axis inclination. Steering axis inclination is an imaginary line through the ball joints like caster is, except now we're viewing it from the front of the car. So I'm looking at this tire. Here's the tire. Here's the suspension engines over here. Here's my true vertical line, zero. Steering axis inclination is the imaginary line through the ball joints and usually the angle is like this because we want the weight of the car to be projected as close to the center line of the tire as we can to reduce steering effort okay so it's an imaginary line through the ball joints viewed from the front of the car it attempts to project the weight of the vehicle at the center line of the tire patch like i was just saying the goal of steering axis inclination is to project the weight of the vehicle at the center point of the tire contact patch. Okay. It decreases steering effort by doing that. So if you bring in the weight down inside, or you bring the weight down outside, you have more steering effort. This is going to reduce rolling resistance. So you have less rolling resistance by projecting the weight right underneath the center line of the tire. It's a diagnostic angle used to determine if parts are bent. So what we say is, if the SAI is off, then we say, okay, maybe we got a bent control arm here, a bent control arm here, or a bent knuckle here. Something's bent. Um, so we use it for diagnosis. Because if you think about it, when you start lining a car, how do you know the person didn't hit something and bend the steering or suspension or uh, component? This is the most important part of directional stability is steering axis inclination. It's the most important part of directional stability, meaning 
keeping the the weight of the car projected into the center of the tire is going to have the greatest effect on the stability of the car and where it wants to go. It also helps to return the steering wheel to a straight ahead position after a turn. So when you turn like this, it tends to affect how we return to a straight ahead position. Okay, kind of like caster. It also reduces the need for excessive camber. So if this was coming straight down like this, we would have to have a lot of positive camber, let's say, um, in order to get the contact patch of the tire to hit where the weight's coming down. So we can keep the tire fairly straight and use the angle of suspension to project the weight near the center of the contact patch of the tire, okay? Steering axis inclination or King pin inclination, think old school Ford mono beam and twin I beam suspensions, or ball joint inclination are all the same thing. Okay? Steering axis inclination, king pin inclination, ball joint inclination. Again, it's just an imaginary line through the steering pivots as viewed from the front of the car. Okay, let's stop here for now. All right, so just one other thing on SAI, and that is that it's not an adjustable angle, and I should have gotten this. If, at the end a moment ago. But anyways, uh, SAI is not an adjustable angle. It's a diagnostic angle that's going to tell us if parts are bent like we talked about. So let's continue here. So um, the next angle is what we call scrub radius. Scrub radius is a, like it says, it's a distance between SAI where SAI hits the street. So like here's SAI hitting the street and the center of the tire contact patch. So here you have uh, what we call a positive scrub radius, and that's also a positive scrub radius. That's a zero scrub radius where the SAI projects the weight of the vehicle right at the center of the tire contact patch. Uh, this would be a positive scrub radius as well. We'll talk about included angle in just a moment. Um, SAI hitting inside the tire center line, so like here, um, is positive scrub radius, and this will deflect the toe out. SAI hitting the outside, outside the center line would be, in other words, if it came out over here and it contacted the street over here outside the, the center line of the tire contact patch, this would be um, a negative scrub radius. This deflects the toe in. So this is used on some front wheel drive vehicles. Some engineers um, design it in these kinds of ways to um, to affect the geometry of the steering. So the less scrub radius, the better the handling. In other words, if we can get the weight of the vehicle to be projected through SAI right down at the center of the tire contact patch, the car will handle better, okay? Um, toe out on turns are what's called turning radius. So toe out on turns or turning radius means that the outside wheel during a turn has some additional toe out. So as you're turning around a corner, get over here like this. This one tends to deflect out. So you can see that here um, as we turn the corner, this one will deflect out a little bit um, or the toe will just, sorry, I shouldn't say that one, but the toe will deflect out a little bit and that helps to return it to a straight head position. Um, and that's in, designed into the um, suspension or into the steering system, okay? So toe out on turns or turning radius um, helps to return the car to a straight head position out of a turn. And like it says here, it prevents the outside wheel from wearing because the outside wheel will have to get pretty sharp uh, on a turn to follow the other wheel. Um, so we don't often think about that, but there's a fair amount of geometry that's involved in trying to make the car uh, not wear the tires and not screech, etc so much on a turn and also return to a straight ahead position. That's called two out on turns. So next is tracking. Tracking is the relationship of the rear wheel tracks to the front wheel tracks when the tr car is driven straight ahead. So if you look at the car here um, from overhead, the rear wheels will either track hopefully straight centered to the car, or they'll be deflected off one way or the other, depending on um, the wear of the vehicle, especially if it's a construction vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. 
the front wheels are always going to track with the rear wheels. The rear wheels determine essentially where the car is going to go because it's a fixed thing unless you have a rear steer car. So the relationship of the rear tracks of, uh, to the front um, is called tracking. So tracking is off if the rear wheels are not following the front wheels when going straight. We call this dog tracking. So if you've ever been going down the highway and you've got a construction truck or anything in front of you, and you look at it and you notice that you can see down the side of the car, like the, the rear of the car is kicked over to one side. We call it dog tracking because if you ever look at a dog trotting, uh, they always trot with their rear end over to one side. And it's to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. Just kidding. That's a joke. But um, And I don't know if, it's, if there's any sort of universal axiom about which way the dogs have their rear end kicked over to. But when they trot, they don't trot straight. They trot slightly to one side. Um, and, and you can kind of imagine why. Because when they bring their rear legs forward, if they were straight ahead, their rear legs, I'm supposing, might hit their front legs coming back. So they've got to be slightly over to one side. So when the rear legs come forward they're, and their front legs come back, they don't hit. Anyways, enough of that stuff. Let's keep going here. So if the rear wheels are off, in other words, if the rear, rear wheels are not straight and parallel to the center line of the car, the front wheels will straighten themselves out to run parallel to the rear wheels. And consequently, the steering wheel will go like this. So in other words, in order for the car to go straight, the front wheels must run parallel to the rear wheels. The rear wheels are a fixed angle. So ideally, we want the rear tires to be parallel to the center line of the car. And so we say that the rear wheels always and only con uh, control tracking. Look at these three pictures. So you have the true center line of the car, and you have what's called the thrust line. The true center line of the car is just, you know, take the two halves of the car, perfectly parallel down the center, there's the center line. The thrust line is the line that's parallel to the rear wheels. Now, if the rear wheels are parallel to the center line of the car, then the thrust line and the center line are the same thing. If the wheels are kicked over like this, the thrust line's going off at that angle, and the center line's like this, the two are not the same. In order for the car to go straight, the steering wheel's going to have to turn a little bit um, and, and not be straight going down the road. Ideally, we want the center line and the thrust line to be the same. The four wheels are perfectly straight to the center line of the car, so they're perfectly parallel, and the steering wheel straight. Um, can we correct for this? Yes, we can in some cases. Okay. So the thrust line is parallel to the rear wheels, like I was just saying, and Tracking is the difference between the thrust line and the center line of the vehicle. Again, the thrust line is the line that's parallel to the rear tires, and the center line is just the true center line of the car. So tracking is the difference between those two that the steering wheel has to make up. Ideally, the thrust line and the center line are the same, like I already said. It is best to align the car to the thrust line. This is called the thrust line method of alignment. If I align the car to the thrust line, then when the car is going straight, my steering wheel will be straight. If I align the car to the, just the true center line of the car, if the, if the car is dog tracking slightly, then when I go down the road, my steering wheel will be slightly turned. Okay? So it's always best to align the car to what we call the thrust line. All right. So what we're going to do now is a bunch of pre-alignment inspection procedures. The first is whenever we're going to do alignment, we're going to do a road test first. We want to know if the car pulls. We want to know how it's behaving, if it's hard to steer, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, we're going to inspect and rotate the tires. If the tires are in good shape, um, we can and we can align the car. We always like to rotate tires, especially if the car had a bit of a pull, because we want to rule out the idea of there being a radial tire that's causing the pull. So it's a good practice to inspect and rotate the tires before an alignment, assuming that the, um, of course, assuming that the um, uh, tire wear is good on the tires. There's a YouTube um, uh, video to watch about inspecting and rotating tires, and it's a really important one about um, where you want your best tread tires. You always want your best tread tires on the rear of the car, not the front, which everybody thinks it's the rear. Watch the video, you'll understand. We want to equalize tire pressure. So when we do alignment, we want the tire pressure to be the same on all four wheels, okay? We're going to measure and correct ride height. That's, sorry, the height is missing there, but 
we're going to measure and correct ride height. And that is, we want to make sure that the car is riding at the right height. If we've got sagging springs one side or in the back, then our alignment angles are going to be off. It's not going to be aligned correctly. Fifth, we're going to do a suspension and steering parts wear inspection. We've got to make sure all the suspension and steering parts um, are wearing properly. Um, we can't have things worn out or we can't align it properly. So we're going to do a suspension and steering parts wear inspection. If any parts are worn, we're going to go ahead and replace them. Let's continue. So now for our alignment procedure, the first thing we're going to do is that pre-alignment inspection that we just uh, listed out right there on the previous slide. Secondly, we're going to remove wheel bearing play if it's adjustable. Um, this is kind of old school. We don't do this anymore because we don't normally have taper roller bearings that are adjustable in the front of any car anymore. No front wheel drive car does. Only some rear wheel drive cars are old cars. Why do we get the wheel bearing play out? Because we don't want to throw our camber readings off with too much play. We're going to check wheel run out or what we call wheel compensation. The most all machines like our machine takes this into account um, just by rolling the car forward and rolling it back. It just looks to see if the wheel is true or if it's bent. And it just takes it into account so that we're not trying to align a, a car with a bent wheel and affect our camber in particular. We're going to measure and set rear wheel WH for wheel, camber, and toe if rear wheel alignable. So we're always going to align the rear of the car. We're going to measure and set rear wheel, camber, and toe if the car is rear wheel alignable. Many front wheel drive cars are alignable in the rear on camber and toe. There's no caster setting on rear tires unless it's a rear steer vehicle. We're going to measure and set front wheel caster and camber next. We're going to do the caster and camber on the front next. We're going to always jounce the car before taking our readings. So before we take our readings, we jounce the car and get the suspension level. And when we um, uh, measure caster, we need to set the brake to measure caster. Okay, camera doesn't matter, but caster it does. You don't want that tire to move or to roll when we're uh, sweeping the wheel to measure caster. Well, these days we use an uh, alignable machine, um, a computer alignment machine. We set our brake pedal depressor. We run through the sweep of the tires. We level and lock the steering wheel with a steering wheel tool, and then we go ahead and start doing our adjustments. Um, then we're going to set tracking, and that just means that we're going to adjust the front tires so that they're tracking to the rear, and then we'll set tow. So all modern computerized cars set tracking and tow together. You don't really even know you're setting tracking. Um, steering wheels level and lock straight ahead, and the computer says set the tow, you set the tow, you're done. Okay, But essentially we're setting tracking and tow at the same time. And we're going to do tow with the brake free and the steering wheel locked. Um, you can you don't have to unlock you don't have to take the brake pedal depressor off the car when you do tow but um, we're gonna, we do want the um, steering wheel to be locked when we adjust tow and tracking okay it's got to be locked straight ahead okay so a little bit about alignment equipment so we must have a, a rack that's a flat register table and I have to take my level and make sure that the rack is level this way and across this way periodically and um, so rack must be flat. Leveling legs are used to achieve this. We have leveling legs to make sure we can get the rack perfectly flat. Um, major impacts to the rack, uh, we got to check it for flatness. So if a car bumps into the rack or car falls off the rack, um, hopefully not. But if that were to happen, we would want to recheck the rack and make sure um, it's level, etc. We have to have um, turntables and slip plates. So there's a picture of turntables and slip plates, turntables and slip plates in the front and just slip plates in the rear. The turntables ena enable us to get caster and camber readings. Slip plates allow us to get camber readings. Turntables and slip plates must be loose or the vehicle will not see its proper ride height. So when we jounce the car, the tires need to be able to move in and out, etc. And they also need to be able to rotate when we're sweeping the wheel for checking uh, the alignment angles. On rear suspension, rear independent suspension, like it says, you must have rear slip plates for settling the suspension. And what we used to do when we, if on racks, our previous rack, where we didn't have slip plates on the rear, you could put wax paper under the rear wheels and it would help 
to get the wheels to settle out when you jounce the car when you're settling the suspension. Next, um, so for rear adjustment, you have to have a rear slip plate. So for a rear toe adjustment, you have to have a slip plate or wax paper. Uh, for four wheel steering, you must have a table capable of providing seven degrees of rotation for the rear wheels. We have that, okay? Um, alignment machines can be either, can either be mechanical or computerized. Everybody uses computerized today. We used to have mechanical magnetic cages. Doesn't work anymore because everybody's got aluminum wheels, etc. Mechanical requires more time because each angle must be looked at independently. And yeah, we could use um, uh, clamps that went over the tire and then put a magnetic gauge, but we don't do any of that anymore. We just have really, really simple targets on our um, computerized machine. Mechanical requires more time because each angle has to be looked at independently. Computerized machines are able to read all angles with one sweep of the wheel, which is and if all the readings come up and we see what it is. Okay. A couple of things about alignment methods. First, eccentric cams. So many cars have what we call eccentric cam bolts where the bolt is offset to a washer and the washer pries against a bracket on the frame. And that is used for setting caster and camper. Okay. Um, secondly, we have a shim adjusted car. Here's one here with a control arm. The shims go back in here between the upper inner control arm and the frame. And so all American cars used to be adjusted for caster and camber with shims. Nothing is anymore, at least that I've seen. Okay. Next, we can use a strut rod um, like this one here. Sometimes we'll have a lock nut here and a lock nut here. We can loosen this one, tighten this one, lengthen that, or we can tighten this one, loosen that one shorten that and that would affect caster it does actually also affect toe a little bit but the intention is not to change toe the intention on the strut rod adjustment is to change caster um we can have a movable control arm think chrysler they used to do this where you loosen the bolts and you literally and you had slotted holes down here and you'd move the whole control arm like this or like this to adjust caster and camber um, so that still is out there on dodge dakotas um, eccentric ball joint, ball joint, um, sorry, eccentric ball joint, think uh, Ford trucks, where the upper ball joint, the bolt is off center, so you turn this hex and it moves the whole upper control arm ball joint area in or out or forward or backward, and that's caster and camber. And they're a little tricky to adjust in my um, humble but correct opinion. Okay, so uh, McPherson strut tower. Um, we can have a McPherson strut come up and these holes can be slotted so we can pull the strut forward, backward, in, out. And that's a way on a front wheel drive car that does not have any caster or camber adjustment, how we can get some caster camber adjustment. Um, uh, again, on a vehicle that is not, doesn't come from the factory like that, we can slot the holes um, and then do that. All right, so that's what we have for alignment. We'll be looking at an alignment uh, um, demo here pretty quick.